Hello, everyone, and thank you for logging into this, uh, this episode of our Rupus Core Series webinar. Uh, continuous online education, it's about our brand. We educate all the time, and this is uh, another one in a continuing series of uh, some very important information and, and topics that uh, uh, are helpful to your everyday uh, business and polishing and detailing uh, life. So, what we have for you today, we'll jump right in, and this is the five paint correction myths. And our team reviewed these topics. We selected these for two reasons. One is they are very popular topics that get discussed a lot. And reason number two, um, they are, uh, lots of people get confused about the facts. So they're talked about, debated, argued about, but many people are kind of not clear on the facts. So we are here to present the facts to you so that you can have a better awareness of these topics. So you might be watching this content. Oh, by the way, I'm Jason Rose with Rupus on our training team. And you might be watching this content on Zoom live. And if that's the case, you have the webinar controls. You can enter your topics or sorry, enter your comments and your questions at any time throughout this presentation in that Q&A icon down at the lower part of your screen. So please do enter con comments and questions at any time throughout this presentation. We will have a dedicated, allocated time at the end of our presentation to interact with you and answer your questions directly as we can. So another way you might be watching this content is Facebook Live. And if you are watching on Facebook Live now, then you can also enter comments and questions. However, our team may not be monitoring those directly. We're gonna try, but our team um, will definitely get back to that after the webinar and respond as we can. Another way you could be watching this content is on demand on the Rupus YouTube channel. And if you're watching on the YouTube channel, then this is a pre-recorded version of the webinar. Thank you for watching. And please, if you are not subscribed to the Rupus YouTube channel, please do so. And uh, you will get a steady stream of our latest and greatest content. So we are pumping in all kinds of fantastic information into our YouTube channel. And you definitely want to be subscribed so you get those notifications. So a bit about Rupus, uh, you might know this already, but for those that don't, uh, Rupus has two major global headquarters, our main headquarters in Milan, Italy. At that location, we manufacture tools, dust extraction systems, as well as polishing pads and compounds. Rupus has extreme expertise in this area of developing all the components that make up the polishing result, the tool, the pad and the compound, we control all of those components in-house and we manufacture there. We also have a Bigfoot Academy at the Milan, uh, Italy location where we educate on a regular basis. We have a sister facility in Denver, Colorado, and that is where I am uh, right now presenting to you. At this facility, we also manufacture the tools, both electric and pneumatic. And we have a sister Bigfoot Academy at this location where we educate on a regular basis. Uh, so those are our two locations. Now presenting with me today is uh, Dylan Von Kleiss, our marketing manager in North America, and he is operating the background controls. Uh, Dylan, you're doing a fantastic job so far. And um, he will also be coordinating our question and answer session at the end of this presentation. So thank you, Dylan, for everything you do. Uh, we are going to jump right into the meat and potatoes of this presentation. So these five myths, as I mentioned, uh, were reviewed by our team. We selected these specifically because they're hot topics. Um, presenting with us today, co-presenting, is uh, Todd Helm, our senior technical advisor, he is broadcasting from Florida. We'll bring him up in a moment. But here are the five topics. So 
first is a very hot topic. Heat helps reflow the paint and remove scratches. So that is myth number one. We're gonna do a deep dive and clear up all the misconceptions about this one. Myth number two, rotary is the fastest way to correct paint. We're gonna review that one pretty well. Myth number three, you can't use silicone products in a body shop or a fresh paint environment. So we're gonna clear up all the confusion there. Myth number four, faster tool speed, doesn't matter what tool, faster tool speed is the most important factor for defect removal. We have a deep dive into this topic. And then finally, the fifth one, pad rotation with a dual action random orbital is necessary for paint correction. So we are going to explore that topic very well uh, as well. So we're going to review these and do a deep dive. We're gonna present you with the facts. We're gonna help you to understand what is going on with each of these topics. And to, to present the very first one for you today, we are going to kick this over to Mr. Todd Helm in Florida to present myth number one. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, I, I liked your introduction about this particular one being a hot topic, right? Um, which is uh, extremely apropos. And the first one is that we need heat to either um, reflow the paint, right? Or remove paint defects. So there's two issues we wanna look at here. Is heat necessary in the removal of paint defects? Uh, we can even go into that a little bit further and see if it's beneficial. And then also to reflow paint and fill in the scratches. And you kind of hear this one from some of the old timers. When we look at these uh, myths and we need to determine if they are true or false, it's beneficial to often look at the origins of these. And this one has been around for a long time. It's probably been a around since the dawn of automotive refinishing and paint polishing. And it kind of came about from what we can tell somewhere around the 1940s when automotive refinishing started to become more and more popular and you stopped bolting on new panels on repaired cars. So there was the rise of the body shop industry um, and then repainting and finishing those defects. And back in those days, you were working on a non-curing uh, nitrocellulose paint, right, uh, lacquer. So you could heat it up and there is some debate on whether or not it was malleable enough to move around. And, and that debate also continues today. But we are also, anybody who does paint correction nowadays benefits from uh, the, the advent of fine sandpapers, 1000 grit and finer, 3000, 5000, so on. Well, back in the, this time frame, we were looking at sandpaper as really a sheet of paper with rocks attached to it. And the, the, const, the, the normal grits were 400, maybe 600 was considered fine. So they were putting deep scratches in the refinishing process into the paint. Now, the only type of polisher used back then was a high speed rotary polisher. And this was done, you needed a very aggressive compound often referred to as rocks in a bottle. And you needed a very aggressive compound and you needed to lean into it with a lot of pressure. Now, this process would certainly remove the sanding scratch, but the result would be a hot surface. And in scientific discovery, there's a saying that causation does not equal correlation. Just because something appears to be some way doesn't mean it is. That's why we have to investigate this myth. But you grind away at the paint, it gets very hot, the scratches are gone, it's very easy to say A equals B, heat equals scratch removal. So this is the assumption and probably the origin of this myth. Going into that a step further, we need to look at what exactly is paint polishing? What is defect removal? Well, as the graphic on the right of the screen should illustrate, polishing paint or sanding paint or any type of defect removal is a frictional process where you are removing the height of the scratch and bringing it down to the valley of the scratch. And the primary factor that controls this is friction, whether it's sandpaper sliding across the paint or a liquid polish attached to a pad and moving across the paint. It's a frictional process. 
Um, one thing we do know is that heat is a byproduct of friction. Uh, it's very difficult to have a frictional energy without this, this process. So um, we know that friction is necessary to polish paint, but is heat necessary? So now we're going to kind of dive into it just a little bit further. Um, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves when we state that anything is necessary is can we do it without it? Because if we can do, if we can do a process without heat, then we can simply eliminate the, the concept that it's necessary. Well, anybody who's ever wet sanded a car, particularly with a dual action sander, but also by hand, can tell you you can effectively remove material with a very minimal increase in heat. Sure, some of that friction is causing a minor, minor, minor increase in heat, but sometimes it's not even measurable. So we know we can sand and remove defects. And also one of the big advantages of a random orbital polisher in particular is its ability to remove paint defects without heat. So we know inherently you can remove paint defects without the addition of heat. But is heat beneficial or is it, does it have a negative impact? And, that, and that's kind of where we want to explore from here. Well, I am a big fan, especially because I work in a buy shop a lot, of trying to do as much correction as I can without heat. And that's because of the potential for paint to swell when heat is injected into it, right? So especially in a fresh paint environment that the paint is less than 24 hours old, or if you're working on soft paint, anybody that's ever had the pleasure of polishing a Subaru or some of the, the um, foreign, like Asian cars that are native to Asia, the paint is so sticky and soft that you get a lot of heat when you polish. And so as we apply friction to this soft surface, it's gonna cause that paint to expand. And, and my favorite analogy is a balloon. If a balloon is deflated, it's wrinkled. Those wrinkles are similar to the scratches we see on the diagram on the screen. When we blow that balloon up with air, it's similar to what happens to the paint. As it expands, the surface stretches. And so as the heat goes into the paint, we can see the surface becoming smoother. Now this is giving us an illusion that the paint defects have been removed, but in reality, we have now blown up the paint and we actually have to wait for that paint to come back down before we can really effectively continue paint correction. So one of the big negative impacts of heat is that it can create the false illusion that we've removed paint defects. Um, the second part of this myth is reflowing paint. And this is uh, not a debate that's a matter of opinion. This is a debate that is solved by science and from the paint manufacturers and their chemists, and also the chemists that Rupus employs. Uh, modern paints are categorized as thermoset polyurethane technology. What that means in the terms, in layman terms, in other words, terms that I understand it, is that it is a one-time process. Once the paint has catalyzed and cured, it cannot be brought back into a liquid state. This is a one time, it's locked and it's done. This is not like spackle on your house where you can, you know, it dries in the container, you add a little more water and it becomes a, a, a mud again. Once it's dry, it's dry. And so once it's been properly mixed and applied and cured or air dried, it cannot reconstitute. It cannot melt back into a liquid state. It's just a scientific impossibility. The chemistry of this material doesn't allow for it. Um, now, acrylic lacquer and nitrocellulose paints, again, the old lacquers, previous to mid-1980s, going all the way back through the dawn of the automotive age, there is some belief that with enough heat, enough frictional heat, you could move it around a little bit. Whether this technically would qualify as reflowing is what the debate is. So um, one more thing when we talk about reflowing paint is that um, sustained paint uh, temperature, so sustained friction above 180 degrees, um, roughly 80 degrees centigrade, uh, can damage the micro bonds that hold the paint layers together. So 180 degrees, a black car can achieve this in the Florida sun where I'm from, but when that is 180 degrees and that temperature is combined with frictional movement on the surface, it can actually delaminate the paint. So you actually will have a separation of the individual paint layers. The uh, clear coat can come off the base coat, the base coat can separate from the priming or etching agent, or all of the layers can actually release from the body panel. Uh, this is really a problem when we talk about putting a lot of pressure and attempting to reflow fresh paint. 
because in some cases that type of motion can cause the, the bonds which are still curing, it's still locking, it's still wet, to twist off. You can cause permanent paint damage on fresh paint. Um, if we apply enough friction and enough temperature to modern cured catalyzed paint, it will actually turn to ash and burn or it will melt. Imagine a plastic Easter egg with a lighter if you ever did that as a kid because I, I certainly didn't. Um, and then of course we have perhaps the, the origin of this myth is that when we get the paint hot and we're attempting to reflow it, it smooths out, we blow it up, the orange peel goes away, the scratches appear to reduce and then we run into a case where it looks like we have slickened the paint or we have moved it around, but in essence, it's really just swollen. Um, so when we look at this myth and, and we're gonna determine whether it's true or false uh, that you need heat to remove paint de defects or reflow the paint and fill in the scratches, this is one of the easier ones to go ahead and stamp a, a busted on it. It's just simply not true and in, in no chemistry or science can it be true. And in fact, this chase for adding heat to the paint can cause more negative impact than positive benefits. So with that, we'll go ahead and hand over the next series of myths back to Jason in Colorado. And then I will be joining you for the fifth myth. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Todd. That was a very good uh, explanation of that myth. Now we're off to myth number two which is about rotary polishers. So this topic is specifically focused on rotary polishers and the uh, perception that they are the fastest way to correct paint, fastest way to remove paint defects. So we'll look at the background of this uh, myth. Uh, here are some facts about rotaries. Now rotary, of all the different polishing methods available today, Rotary is, in fact, the oldest method uh, that exists. It uh, is the way that we started polishing paint um, years ago. And also, given the global perspective, and if you think of every person in the world that is putting the machine to paint and polishing, it is the most polish, uh, popular polishing method available um, and has been for a long time. So globally, body shops, detail shops, anybody polishing paint, rotary still is in fact the most often used method of polishing paint. And by contrast, we look at rotary application compared to this dual action random orbital method, um, which is a fairly recent phenomenon um, in, in machine polishing. And the reality is that today, uh, with dual action random orbitals, we have system approaches now that didn't exist uh, a few decades ago or a couple decades ago. So the, the idea of the tool, the compound, the pad, all working together as a system, that's a fairly recent phenomenon. So going back 20, 30 years, the gap in performance in defect removal capability was very wide between rotary and dual action random orbitals. Uh, but that gap uh, today has kind of been closed a bit. It's much tighter uh, because of the development of a system approach for random orbitals. And speaking of that, the dual action, um, big for large diameter ran random orbital, again, a fairly recent phenomenon launched in about 2010 uh, but now that gap between rotary performance and DA performance is um, getting very, very close. But let's deep dive into this rotary movement. Now the actual tool movement is what I'm talking about here. Uh, given a pad spinning on a center axis, what we know about the pad velocity in this movement is that the pad velocity is greater going out to the outside edge of the pad. So it is slower actually pad velocity in the middle and increasing out to the edge, it's actually uh, faster and faster pad velocity. So taking a look at this, let's say for example at 1200 RPM, which is a constant, this is one measure of this, the pad speed, 1200 RPM constant uh, throughout the pad. Let's look at the difference in the pad velocity 
uh, between the center of the pad and the outside. So at 1200 RPM, the pad velocity would be about five miles per hour in the middle, uh, about almost nine kilometers per hour. Uh, but if you go to the outside edge of the pad, that velocity is now increased to 25 miles per hour or about 40 kilometers per hour. And then if we take another look at two other points on the pad, you can actually see the progression of pad velocity from the middle out to the outside edge. And again, this is with the constant of 1200 RPMs. So the point of this is to understand that reality of this movement. And when you put this spinning disc on a flat surface, there is this built-in tendency of this movement to leave its own mark. And it's because of the movement of the tool. Um, we call this a swirl mark, we call this a hologram, but this is the tendency of, of the rotary movement itself to impact that surface by leaving this mark. And again, this is a tendency and it can be mitigated by skill, pad choice and liquid choice, but given all rotary tools are the same movement, this movement itself has this propensity for leaving this mark. And then another feature of rotary application is because it's a disc spinning around, it has this tendency to throw product. So it can actually take compound or polish on the outside edge of this pad because it's spinning around. Um, it can actually throw compound across the car, across the room. Uh, it can throw compound very easily. And again, this is uh, not so much a skill thing, but it, it speaks to the actual movement of the tool. Another um, characteristic of a rotary application is because of this disc spinning around and the high velocity on the outside edge of the pad, we kind of need to protect this pad from vulnerable parts on the car. Uh, so we tape off these vulnerable areas, we tape off cracks and crevices and door jams, and this is to protect those areas from splatter and uh, impact from this rotary movement. So this is something that professionals do as part of the rotary application. Another look at this is the time. If you measure the time it takes to actually do the rotary application compared to random orbital or gear driven. And again, we're looking at a global perspective, the average person doing a rotary application, that they will likely wash the car, wash or clean or solvent wipe the surface first. They will likely tape off those vulnerable areas and protect the door jams and cracks and crevices. And these two steps take time. And they will likely do a compound step to remove defects. And because of the sometimes messiness of the rotary application, they may clean that paint surface again and then do a second step polish and possibly a third step final polish. And then they're finished with that job. Uh, so this compared to the random orbital and gear driven application, a lot of the in-between cleaning steps and much of the uh, preparatory protection steps are either minimized or eliminated and also the potential for the dual action orbital um, methods to leave a very good finish on its first and only step. So you can see these checkered flags here. That is the potential for being finished with the job. Uh, so there's actually an early potential with random orbital and gear driven to be completely finished, uh, swirl free, hologram free, uh, defect free earlier in time. Uh, so here's another fact. This is an independent study by a high volume detailing operation that was doing a complete rotary procedure on uh, the high volume cars they were doing every day. Now this is not Rupus doing a study. This is an independent company providing Rupus with some feedback. They concluded based on their multi-month uh, test of random orbital system compared to rotary, they, res they conclude that it's 22% faster uh, than the rotary application they were doing. So this is now independent um, 
factual information from a high volume user of uh, polishing systems. So one thing to point out here is we are not disputing the fact that rotary is the fastest defect removal. We are not challenging this fact. It is a fact. Compared to all other methods, the rotary has the potential and the capability to rip out defects faster than any other method. It's actually got a faster defect removal rate. However, what we are saying is that the trade-off to that very quick raw defect removal is that there is additional time required or can be additional time required in subsequent polishing steps and for the cleanup and preparation. So if you factor the entire job from start to finish, that is what we're looking at here, not the fact that the rotary can rip off paint faster than any other way. Um, we're not disputing that. Another important thing to consider while we are talking about this is there is a very influential impact on the results and that is the operator's skill. That is your skill with the machine that you're using. Now, there is a situation where uh, uh, someone with a dual action random orbital skill set that is very refined, very developed, sometimes they can get rotary-like defect removal because their skills with the random orbital are so tuned and so refined. Now, on the other hand, there are rotary skill sets, people using rotary every day, who can minimize and mitigate and be efficient with the rotary application. We are not taking this away from you. Um, it is a fact that skills will impact the results you get with these different tools. And the fact is that Rupus, we offer complete solutions in the rotary space as well as the orbital space. So we are loud and proud about both of them. We are not bagging on either one. We are just presenting the facts about efficiency as you compare these two approaches. So um, a blended approach, for those of you that might not have considered this, and some people do this every day, is you can actually remove sanding marks or heavy defects with a rotary on your first step and then finish with a dual action random orbital on the second step. This is a hybrid approach. It's a multi-tool approach, but it works very well for some people and you're getting the best of both worlds. Um, so. Rotary polishers are the fastest way to correct paint. We are going to say this one's busted uh, because there is in fact more efficient ways. And again, we're talking about start to finish on the job, not the actual capability of an individual approach. Another side note that's important to mention at this moment in time in our history of polishing paint, the reality that we are faced with every day is that paint Thickness is progressively getting thinner and thinner on every new car model year that's introduced. This is a reality. Maybe you have noticed this, but it is happening year on year. Paint is getting thinner and thinner. So this is something we all need to think about. We can no longer immediately go straight to the, the fastest, most aggressive way to rip out defects on paint. We now need to be thinking a different way. We need to think about precise control of our defect removal rate. And this is so we leave the most amount of paint on the car possible. This is now a priority um, rather than completely thinking about the fastest way to mow down paint. Um, it's like if you have heart surgery, we can do that with a chainsaw or we can do that with a scalpel. Um, hopefully you're not trying that on your own. Um, all right, on to myth number three. This particular topic is about silicone products, specifically silicone products used in a body shop environment or a fresh paint environment. Lots of confusion about this area. So the use of silicone products are generally perceived to be a problem for fresh paint. The average person believes that it's a problem. And there's very, um, there's a lot of confusion about some words and terms that we use. 
Body shop safe is something that we uh, describe in this area. Paintable is another word thrown around. Silicone free is another one that's on product labels. But there's a lot of confusion in this area. And in fact, there's many body shops or paint shops or collision repair centers that have the stance, they have the position that if it contains silicone, it is not coming through my door. Um, they simply believe that silicone as a broad stroke statement is not good in their body shop and it is being refused. So if it contains silicone, we are not going to have it in the building. Um, but here are the facts. Body shop safe is very misunderstood concept and it's actually used many, many times incorrectly because it does not mean that the item does not contain silicone. That's not what body shop safe means. In fact, what it means is that that particular item can be used in a body shop environment um, without issues, without contamination and without problems. That's what body shop safe means. Now, another thing to realize about silicone in the body shop environment and in um, collision repair centers is silicone as an ingredient, it's not one thing. It's a long list of many types of silicones and the quality and the type of silicones range. It's a big range. So these silicones are used in many other industries, aerospace, medicine, um, and other areas, but just know that silicone is not one thing, it's many things. Now, going back to the body shop and the fresh paint environment, for those that believe they do not want any silicone ingredients in any product in their building, here is a reality, and maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, but there are lots of items in the body shop that are used every day that contain silicone. So we're talking about adhesives, seam sealers, gasket materials, and lubricants. Now here's another product that is specifically interesting in this topic, and that is a fisheye eliminator. So a fisheye is the description for the defect that we call the contamination as a result of a silicone on a fresh application of paint. We call that damage a fisheye. Now there is this product called a fisheye eliminator that painters use to mitigate and minimize this potential for uh, the defect for a fisheye. And interesting fact, the product used to prevent the problem with silicone contains silicone. So, the point on this is that there are lots of items in a body shop that contain silicone. So what is the issue then? Well, the issue is on its application of the item. So there is uh, products that are hand wiped on, machine applied, sprayed. If you have a sprayable silicone, an, an item that is sprayed or atomized into the air and it contains silicone, this is where the real problem arises. This is where the real issue is. And actually, it's not only silicones. It is any product that is sprayable that has oils or whatever can cause fish eye. So another thing to consider in addition to the application is the preparation before painting the car. And common, acceptable, educated practices that painters use will prevent uh, the silicone problem from happening. So this is actually preparing the panel before you paint the car. So doing this preparation properly can actually avoid many application issues. All right, so to wrap this up, our conclusions about silicone in the body shop is that there are many body shop safe products that contain silicone. And then Coincidentally, there are also many that do not contain silicone and some that contain silicone, but if they are sprayed, that could be a problem because that can cause that silicone contamination damage if it's airborne in the paint booth before you paint. Um, the application method has a big influence on this damage. 
it's not so much the focus on silicone as an ingredient. Um, and proper paint prep preemptively prevents permanent paint problems. That's a mouthful. Now you'll remember about preparation. So silicone products, you can use them in a body shop. We are gonna say this concern about silicone uh, itself as an ingredient is busted, but remember, pay attention to airborne sprayable products in general. All right, we're going on to myth number four. Um, if you have a comment or question about any of these myths we're talking about, please do enter them into that Q&A box. If you're able to, if you're watching the recording, uh, you can't do that now. So myth number four. This myth is about faster tool speed and the assumption that it is the most important factor for paint defect removal. A little bit of background on this myth. Uh, the perception widely around the world is that more tool speed equates to more defect removal. Many of us, if there are six speed settings on the tool, we're looking for number seven. So it doesn't matter what type of tool we're talking about. It's this idea that more tool speed means more aggressive defect removal. So another thing to consider about this myth is that tool speed is a variable around the world. Um, North and South Americas historically have had higher tool speeds on their tools, specifically with rotary, whereas Europe and Asia generally have lower tool speeds um, comparatively. Uh, so um, another thing about this uh, high tool speed is the assumption um, that it creates a lot of surface heat, which it, it can. Um, but the assumption is that that additional tool speed, that additional heat will increase the rate of defect removal. Um, and we've already addressed uh, that one about heat. So that whole paint swelling thing, we already addressed the uh, misconceptions about that. Now, here's another thing to think about tool speed. Tool speed is one of five different variables that impact the result that we get when we machine polish paint. So by focusing on tool speed, we are zooming in on one of five different things that the user can do to impact defect removal. So the other four have a great impact on defect removal in addition to tool speed. So we're talking about application area, arm speed, pad angle, downward pressure and tool speed. Those are the five variables that make up the technique that all of us use. Now of the five, pressure, downward pressure, if we're specifically looking at defect removal power, that probably has the most influential impact on the result. But the reality is that they all contribute. Another thing to be mindful of about tool speed is that when it's cranked up way too high and that pad is just spinning around like crazy on, on the surface, there could be a condition called a hydroplaning effect. This is where the pad is just skimming across the surface. And what we're doing in this condition is we are really not giving the pad and the compound and the abrasives in the compound the time it needs on the surface to actually do what it needs to do, which is remove defects. It's literally skimming across on the surface and we are resulting in less defect removal, not more. And then of course, this heat thing uh, that we can generate surface heat, pad temperature can increase, we can stress com uh, internal components in the tool and the pad and the tool and everything it impacts durability. So many of you, and you know who you are, you operate your polishing tool at maximum speed on every panel of every car every day. And what we're here to tell you is if that's what you do, uh, you are maximizing the stress on all of the components that you're using and maybe even fatiguing yourself. Um, and we're, we're pretty much saying it's not necessary. There's a way to get efficient results um, with 
without all that tool speed. So tool speed, not directly proportional to defect removal rates. Um, this is what we're talking about in this myth. And as you can probably guess, we are busting this one, but tool speed is only one of the five variables and too much tool speed can actually reduce your defect removal. Again, we talked about earlier myth about the impact of heat and paint swelling. Um, you actually have to slow down and wait for that paint to cool down to effectively remove defects. So it's, it's actually impacting your efficiency. Every polisher movement is impacted differently about these five adjustments in technique. Um, so you just gotta realize that they are adjustable. Um, and know that tool speed is not uh, the primary and it's not the only one. In fact, the five together is what creates the result. You can't get the result with every one of these five. Tool speed, pressure, application area, pad angle, and arm speed. They all are important. So tool speed as the most important factor we are going to bust this one, as you might have guessed. All right, so moving on and finishing up with our five myths about pain correction, um, we are going to hand this over to Todd uh, to, to wrap this up for you. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, great job in, in breaking down those three previous myths. And the last myth that we're going to look at today is, um, in some ways, a culmination of the other ones that we've looked at, right? We're gonna be referring back a little bit. And this one is very popular, particularly in the United States, and we hear it expressed a lot of different ways. And generally, when an explanation is asked for it, well, why is this true? Nobody really gives an answer. So what we're gonna do is look a little bit at the science. This is not a particularly deep dive into this. In fact, uh, stay tuned for a potential future Rupus Core Series uh, webinar because this is such an interesting topic in the mechanics of paint polishing that it really helps break down a lot of barriers people uh, encounter. But to get forward, to move forward with this myth, um, if it isn't spinning, it isn't working. And what we're referring to is a random orbital dual action polisher and this perception that some people have. Um, that if the pad suddenly stops to go from a slow rotation to no rotation, all of a sudden, all of the corrective abilities of this polisher come to a halt. And we see this myth repeated in many different, you know, or articulated in many different ways. Uh, if it ain't rotating, it ain't working. Uh, if it doesn't spin, oh, it's stalling, therefore I get no correction. And sometimes this is one of those ones where a understanding of the complex mechanics of a random orbital, again, stay tuned for a future webinar, can help to provide technique adjustments. But before we can go there, we need to really look into this and see if this is a true statement. Um, what are the, 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 the origins of this particular myth? Well, it's a little bit harder to dig into, even though it's a more recent myth. We know that random orbital polishers did not become popular until the 1980s. Um, but one of the potential causes of this is that they're extremely safe and easy to learn. Anybody within reason can grab a random orbital polisher and get decent results in a decent amount of time with a minimal uh, amount of expertise. But because the rotation and uh, orbital action are independent, the operator also has direct control over a large amount of factors. Um, including the orbital pattern, how much energy is transferred. So even though it is a safe and easy tool to begin to learn, it's extremely technique dependent. And that's why you see a number of random orbital experts um, that exist who are able to do amazing things with this style of tool. So there is a, a very safe learning curve, but the potential to really increase your game is very high. Um, going back to the second myth, which was uh, about rotaries and looking at the different size of rotary speed, many do equate rotational speed to polishing ability. Um, this also touches on the previous myth, which is tool speed is the most important factor for, pad ro uh, or for paint correction. Um, so many see the pad spinning fast, the defects are removed, and therefore fast spinning equals defect removal. By the same token, many people see the pad stops to rotate, 
the defects come out at a much slower rate and they say, well, it must be the rotation. That has to be the cause. And oftentimes what we hear is, hey, the paint got hot and the defects were removed, therefore heat equals removal, right? We cannot make a leap from A to B. We have to explore it. And then of course, social media discussion forums uh, have allowed a lot of people who are new or don't have a understanding of the polishing concepts to kind of go on this, this uh, to, to disseminate the information, whether it's good, it has certainly offered a lot of benefits. It's certainly the platform we're using today, but it's also allowed for a lot of people to say false information. So when you combine all this together, you can get a situation where people may not understand that they are simply stating incorrect things. Uh, one of the things that we want to avoid is, uh, you know, using our own personal experience, right? The science and the engineering and the mechanics don't change whether Rupus is presenting the information or another technical manufacturer um, or somebody who's been polishing paint for 30 years and that's their explanation. Uh, again, in the body shop world, hey, I've been polishing for 30 years and you need heat. It doesn't correlate. So looking at this myth in depth, um, a random orbital has two distinct motions, and you can kind of see them on the diagram to the left. The circle, the larger circle, which kind of pierces the curly cues, that would be our rotational uh, distance. And then we have the curly cue, which represents the orbital action as it rotates. And one thing that should be kind of obvious from looking at this photo is that if we were to stretch both of those lines out, the amount of distance covered by the orbital movement is significantly higher than the amount of distance covered by the rotational movement, which tells us we're getting more friction from the orbital action, but we have to, and we are going to break that down a little bit more. But there's two distinct movements. And on a dual action random orbital, the only motion that's dri driven is from the orbit, not the rotation. When we hear people talk about stall, right? Oh, the pad, it's stalled. My orbital polisher is stalling. What they tend to focus on is the rotational movement, the smaller movement, the less impactful movement. And what happens is, is some type of drag or friction from the polished surface is impacting the pad and causing the rotation to stop. And it could be pushing the pad up against an edge. It could be a, a, a high spot in the paint or a convex curve or a concave curve. And so any of these things can cause that rotation to stall. But what we saw from the previous diagram is that if the orbital action is allowed to polish the paint, we should still have plenty of movement for, for correction. So why do these, does this myth tend to exist and is it correct? Um, orbital stall, which is something we don't focus enough on, and the diagrams to the left attempt to explain it visually, is not when the rotation stops, but when the orbital action that is driven by the backing plate and will continue to be driven by the backing plate can no longer effectively transfer through the pad. Another way to think about this, if you take your two fingers and you place them in the palm of your hand and you rub with pressure in a little circle, just a little circle, you'll feel immediately your palms start to get hot. That, you are literally mimicking an orbital polisher and you are making enough friction to heat your paint. If we were to glue 600 grit sandpaper to your fingers, for sure with no rotation, you would go right through your skin. So as long as that orbital movement is present, we have the power for correction. We know that. But what if I was to take a kitchen sponge and I placed it between my fingers and my palm and I did this? Well, that kitchen sponge, the drag, the same drag that's preventing the pad from rotating is going to stick that pad to my palm. And now this kitchen sponge is going to jiggle upon itself like a bowl of jello. This is the problem with an orbital polisher. Um, if the same factor that's causing that pad to stop rotating is also absorbing the orbital movement in the pad, then we are going to lose movement at the paint surface. And we're gonna to attempt to illustrate this a little bit better as we go through the following slides because we're really gonna look at the science behind this and see if this plays out. How do we calculate the value that the rotational movement adds to the polishing action? It's actually fairly simple mathematics, which is a good thing because that is the limit of my mathematical ability. But the first thing we need to do is calculate the velocity of the orbit and the velocity of the rotation and how much that the rotation adds. 
that's going to give us our ability to calculate the potential increase in polishing power. So to, to calculate the distance of the, the orbital movement, it's a matter of taking the, the diameter times pi multiplied by rate. So we're using a 21 millimeter orbit at 4,000 RPM. Uh, very typical polishing speed on a Bigfoot 21. Um, now we can convert that rate to miles per hour or kilometers an hour to kind of just help us visualize it in the real world. And then we will do a similar process the same way, but instead of looking at the orbital movement, we'll look at the rotational movement, but it's calculated the same way. Distance out from center is our diameter times pi multiplied by rate. And the first one we're going to look at is 60 RPM. That means we have an orbiting tool at 4,000, and if we have marked our vacuum plate, it's rotating once per minute. One thing that should be obvious from the previous uh, explanations in this webinar is that a rotary has a variable rate of velocity. The further we go out from the edge, rotational rate, the faster the velocity. An orbital is going to produce the same movement throughout the entire face of the pad. So once we have these two rates, we'll add them together and that will give us the percentage of our increase. Let's start with a 180 millimeter or a seven inch face pad and look at the math on that. So at seven inches, 180 millimeters, um, when we look at the orbital speed at 4,000 orbits per minute with um, a 21 millimeter or it's approximately 0.82 of an inch, you're gonna get 9.85 miles an hour or 15.85 kilometers an hour, right? So roughly 10 miles or 16 kilometers an hour. Again, I wanna emphasize that that is with no rotation. With zero rotation, that is the movement of the pad. That movement is going to polish the paint as long as we can transfer that movement through the pad to the paint with no rotation. Now, if you remember earlier when Jason was uh, explaining the rotary, we saw about 25 miles an hour, so, so almost two and a half times faster on the edge of the rotary. But as we work towards the center, that velocity dropped towards zero and actually will fall to zero in the very center. So the average pad velocity across the entire face of a 21 with zero rotation is not that much slower. It's, it's, it's about 40% or, or I'm sorry, 80% of the entire pad velocity of a rotary at 1200 rpm with the same size pad so let's add the rotational rate we've now managed to add a whopping 1.25 miles per hour to the edge of the pad again at the very edge of the pad we are seeing a 1.25 mile per hour increase so if somebody is making the statement that rotation is necessary for paint correction that's the statement made and that once the rotation stops, all paint correction grinds to a halt or all efficiency is lost, what they're suggesting is that 1.25 miles per hour is absolutely necessary to correct the paint and the 10 miles an hour is not. Um, when we add that together, we see a total speed of approximately 11 miles per hour on the edge or 20 kilometers an hour. That gives us a percentage increase on the edge of 12.5. But what happens as we look towards the inside, especially guys who are, who are confident and, and, and skilled with a random orbital, realize that the outer 5% uh, of that pad really doesn't do much work because it's not as supported by the backing plate. So if we go six inches in, we see that that percentage of increase drops to 10%. The most performance you're gaining potentially at six inches out is 10.3%. That's it. At four inches out, you're gaining 7%, and at approximately one and a half inches out, you're a little bit less than 3%. Again, that is at 60 RPM, one rotation per second. A very, very normal rate for pad rotation. So when you hear somebody say, well, I'm getting pad stall, it's not rotating, I'm losing all my cut, you're losing at most an average, if we average it out from 10% to zero, it's 5%. You're losing an average of 5% of velocity across the entire face of the pad. This is not the factor that's causing the pad to not polish the paint. There's something else. Could be the orbital stall we talked about earlier. So let's look at this a little bit differently. What if we increase the rotational rate to 120 RPM? Now we're going pretty fast. If you that black mark that you might have put on the backing plate, is you know going to 12 o'clock two times a second. In this case, 
again, going back to the previous myth, you might want to increase pressure a little bit because that is a important factor in, in applying the friction to the surface because that's a lot of rotation in a random orbital. But just to take it to the extreme, you are seeing at the pad edge a maximum increase. If that pad is really ripping around and you probably don't have enough pressure on it, you're seeing a maximum increase of about 25%. Six inches in, where you're probably actually doing action, you are seeing 20%. Now, now granted, that 20% is a noticeable increase. It's going to give you a better cut. But is 20% the difference between not cutting at all and maximal cut, or is it just 20%? 14% as we move towards the center, again, cycling down to 0% or 5%, one and a half inches out. So this is the math and the engineering and the science. And this is why Rupus, as a company who is the expert in this field, who has been developing these systems for more than 70 years, will tell you emphatically that orbital action or rotational action, while it's beneficial, is not necessary. Um, another way to break this down is orbital movement. Uh, accounts for, uh, at the worst, at the worst, 75% or more of the total pad movement. It is the dominant movement. It's why we call it a random orbital. It's an orbital polisher. Um, and actually, these numbers are quite similar to a gear driven um, in a different way, because a gear driven is primarily a rotary that moves in and out, but you would be surprised at the numbers there. Now, rotation on a at its very best, if that pad's really ripping around, adds 25% on the edge, not across the face of the pad, on the edge. So again, if we lose 25% of the face and 0% of the center, have we created a situation where we cannot correct the paint? So the impact of rotational stall is overstated. And we go back to that first myth, right? The paint gets hot, therefore, uh, it must be the heat that's reflowing the scratches out. This is a case where the pad rotates and fails to, to rotate, and then we make a determination, well, it must be the rotation, when in fact what it is is that dominant orbital movement is getting absorbed into the pad. If you believe, and I'll give you a preview of the, the future webinar that we're planning on doing, uh, because we want to address how to get around this, but if you believe that the rotation is necessary, in this situation, you're likely, or the trainer who believes this, is likely to tell you to reduce pressure because that way it will allow the rotation to continue. But all you've done is destabilize, destabilize the lateral stability of the pad and allowed even less orbital action to occur. If you run into pad stall, or next time you do, instead of reducing pressure and focusing on the rotation, which at its very best only adds 25%, push down a little bit harder, compress that foam, uh, overcome the orbital stall that's occurring in the pad, and you might be surprised at just how much paint correction you can achieve with zero rotation. We certainly do it all the time. Um, so this myth, if you cannot tell where we're at already, right? Um, if it ain't spinning, it ain't working, is just completely busted, and it really comes from a misunderstanding of the mechanics of random orbital polishing. Um, and with that particular slide i'm going to hand it back to jason and then i think we're going to shoot it over to dylan and then there's going to be an optional uh q a after so if anybody has any questions feel free to stick around for that but thank you very good awesome thanks todd um so we are rounding up the presentation of our five myths and uh we really hope this was uh helpful for you to understand what is going on uh, when you're polishing paint under different characteristics in different situations. So a big thank you for taking the time to view this content. And I want to kick this over to Dylan Von Kleist to talk a bit about how to reach Rupus. If you have any more questions or comments in the future, this is how to reach us. And, uh, and then we'll answer your questions. But we have concluded the the main part of our presentation. If you want to hang out for the questions, then I'll turn this over to Dylan. 
Thank you, Jason and Todd. Great job, guys, and um, lots of interesting stuff. Hopefully, everybody enjoyed this. Uh, we went a little long. We were targeting about 45 minutes. It looks like we hit uh, just about an hour in the presentation. So, as Jason mentioned, if you uh, if you were just here for the presentation, go ahead and log out now. We're going to hang out for another 15, 20 minutes or so and do some live Q&As from some of the questions that I didn't get to in the chat box. If you have a question that's a little bit more in-depth or you want some more expansion on any of the concepts we talked about here, up on your screen now is all of our contact information. Um, don't have to necessarily write it down now. The simplest way to get a hold of us is to go to rupas.com and then go to the Contact Us tab, and you can always send us an email that way. Um, I've sent a number of you guys actually links to videos from our YouTube channel. So um, if you're not already subscribed, because it seems like a number of you were asking questions that we just answered in videos on YouTube, um, head over to youtube.com slash rupas. That's our global channel, and we have been putting up content once a week that answers a lot of these questions like, tool speed and all these different things. So you can get answers to those questions there. Um, and I highly recommend you subscribe because we've got some really cool videos that we've been putting out. So with that, I'm going to let the uh, the guys take over. I'm just going to kind of feed a couple of questions to you. Um, you can both unmute and turn your cameras on, I guess. And uh, we'll start with a couple of simple ones. Um, so I, I've answered a lot of these, but we had a number of questions regarding, uh, especially with the heat and uh, the use of rotary, the the necessary or the need for paint gauges. Um, do we is it a absolute must have if you're trying to, especially to Jason's point um, about the ever thinning. Uh, clear coat on factory cars. Do you need a paint gauge to do paint correction? Is it a good idea to have one? And then a second instrument question, people wanted to know how would they measure uh, paint temperature? What's a good way to kind of monitor paint temperature if they're trying to keep it down? All right, so Todd, I'll take the first one. Um, so paint gauges, I would say the need and the want uh, to be using paint gauges is more important and getting more important than it has been in the past. It's always been important, but now it's getting more important because of the thinning of the clear coats. Um, so I would say if you are on heavy defects, if you're on sanding marks every day, uh, it's going to become more and more of an issue that you're going to be confronted by thin paint. Uh, so the paint gauges really help you to get that no uh, go or no go decision because there will be times you'll measure the paint thickness and simply decide I'm not going to do an aggressive procedure because we don't have enough material. Um, so the paint gauges range in different types. Um, you know we use one at the academy that's actually relatively inexpensive uh, but if you come to our classes we can show you what that's all about. So, it, so the answer is um, yeah the need for paint gauge is uh, getting more important. And then Todd, I'll let you handle the temperature. Sure, there, there, there are, you know, point and click IR thermometers kind of what have become popular um, nowadays, of course, unfortunately with COVID where everybody's scanning your temperature, but they work on the same principle. They scan the, the surface at a certain distance and can measure the temperature fairly accurately. One thing to touch on, um, as an ancillary side note with temperature is always be mindful of the paint surface you're polishing or what is under the paint. If you're polishing on carbon fiber or a composite, keep in mind that those materials don't dissipate heat as quickly and you're going to get a sharper, more dramatic rise in temperature and it's going to stay hotter longer. Um, just as a side note, you know, just something I thought that's worth throwing out there is the, the, the more sensitive that material is to holding heat, the more careful we need to be. And I'm a big, I, I use a, a temperature gauge all the time. Perfect. Okay. Then I had another question. Let's go back up here. Um, actually, a number of questions. I'll just address this as one. People asking, can you use the DA course and find products, the new DA liquids on rotary or rotary on those? Can and should are two different things. They're designed for a specific type of tool movement. You can. There's nothing that's going to stop you from applying DA course to a rotary pad. Um, your experience will probably not be terribly pleasant and the performance will not be as designed. So I don't know why we had so many questions on that. Um, so a question from Joe, he had cutting versus polishing RPM speeds. Um, assuming he means rotary because he's referencing RPM is 1000 to 1200 RPM good for cutting and removing scratches slash watermarks and defects. 
I'm assuming that Joe's talking about rotary applications. Yeah, he said RPM, so I'm going to assume it's a rotary question. Yeah. Um, actually, the, there is no specific RPM speed that we would consider to be ideal. Uh, the way we teach at our academies is that um, the optimal speed is the lowest speed possible to get the target results you're looking for. So we actually teach kind of the different uh, scenario than what the norm is out there. Most people just crank it up to the max and uh, you know that's how they operate the tool. But we actually will ratchet down our tool speed down to the lowest speed possible that will get the desired results without sacrificing efficiency. So we're not talking about being slower, uh, but as we've mentioned several times throughout this presentation, high tool speed is not often the answer to get the best results. Um, so, you know, and when you're cutting compared to finishing, uh, there's also, that's a great future webinar topic, actually, the mm -hmm. difference between the technique between cutting and finishing. Um, but we don't dial it into a specific speed. So we actually will teach you to actually migrate down to the lowest speed possible to get the same, get the desired result. Um, Todd, do you have any other comments on this? No, I agree with everything you said. Um, it is a shift in philosophy for sure to really the best speed is the, the least amount of speed necessary. Right. I mean, and it really with thin paint, thin paint even is going to heat up faster. Um, really we're working against heat. It seems more and more and more and more cars going back to the previous point are composite body materials. So what, whatever the least amount of RPM that does the job efficiently is the best solution for sure. Yep, to okay. everything you said. We have a, this is a, a, it's kind of a broad question. Maybe we can make some recommendations. Vance is trying to make the transition from rotary to dual action random orbital. And assuming he's used to using a rotary with a coarse wool pad for cutting, what would we recommend that he start with if he wants to make that transition to DA? And I am very much assuming just based on the question that it's probably in a body shop would be my guess. Well, I would recommend time. Um, <laughs> it, 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 unfortunately, it's one of those things where you will see debate from guys, and Jason touched on this earlier, the importance of user experience. If you have used a rotary for 20 years, the first time you use a random orbital, if you expect to magically have a better result than what you do with a rotary, then, then it, it wouldn't be fair. Uh, same thing if you've never used a rotary before and you've used a random orbital for 20 years, if we repeat that, it's going to be a messy, slingy, burned edge mess the first time you do that, or potentially will. So my, my first recommendation would be to patiently explore the benefits of a random orbital, because there's many. Um, as far as a direct comparison, I, I, and, and Jason certainly uh, deserves a shot at this too, but really the coarse blue wool pad for me with the up coming soon upcoming DA quartz compound or the current Zephyr compound are both going to give you a really high level of cut for a random orbital polisher. Yeah, agreed. Okay, simple enough. Um, so we have George who actually had a discussion about pad stall with Jason in Norway. So, uh, so he's back for more. Jason, you didn't scare him off the first time. <laughs> um, so he wants to know, uh, he said, you mentioned that it isn't a good thing for your pad to be, your rotation stall to happen for a long time. Can you elaborate on that? So uh, continuous rotation stall, I guess, uh, you know, the whole car. <laughs> yeah, so the way we described this and uh, probably the way I described it there in Norway, um, because I've been saying this a long time as well as other Rupus representatives, but momentary pad stall with a dual action random orbital is not an issue. It's not something to panic about. Um, Todd reviewed this uh, in depth uh, from a very te technical perspective. But momentary pad stall, you're on a curve or a contour, the pad rotation um, stalls a little bit, not an issue. You work through that curve or contour because as we've mentioned, the dominant movement is the orbit. But if you continued to do the entire car in a condition of rotation stall, and as Todd also mentioned, you probably may also have orbital stall, that significantly ramps up temperature 
both on the paint and in the pad and in components in the tool. And you are stressing components. You are using the tool in a way that's going to hurt it long term. So that's why we say don't do a whole car that way, uh, but don't worry about momentary pad stall. The, <clears throat> if I may piggyback on that just a little bit, one of the advantages of a random orbital dual action tool is the dual actions, right? It's this cross hatching effect that really produces a high quality, swirl free, more than likely haze free finish. When we grind down one of the movements, you're now using a single action tool. So anybody in a body shop who's ever used a orbital file board sander knows that if they pause that sander as they're sanding, those little orbits will dig in. It really compromises the surface quality. To get the best performance from a dual action random orbital polisher, you want both movements. You do get a small benefit to polishing, but you get a big benefit of uh, polishing power, but you get a large benefit in finishing quality, pad life, cooling the pad, cooling the backing plate, and finish quality, right? It's, it's a better finish. Um, to touch and reemphasize what, what, to touch on and reemphasize what Jason just said, if you're doing an entire car with no pad rotation, the problem isn't the lack of rotation, it's your technique. It's a technique problem. And, and bad technique on any tool equals bad results. Um, or your tool is simply way too large for the vehicle you're polishing, you need to downsize the tool, but it's a bad technique problem. It's not, it's not the stall. It's, it, it, unfortunately, it's, it's a lack of training or technique, so. Yeah, and you've, you've, you've taken a dual action movement and made it a single action tool, so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's any other ones we should address. We're getting kind of close to the end here, guys. Um, actually, we have a question from Adam. He said there's a lot of discussion, heated discussion online regarding the use of isopropyl alcohol, um, likely for removing residues. Um, some say 50% dilution. Some say 25% dilution. Others say you should not use it at all because, and use the paint prep instead. Are any of these dangerous um, for paint? Uh, should, what should you be using if you're using a prep? Uh, specifically, I think probably talking to the uh, body shop guys too. Um, what's what's safe in that environment on paint? Yeah, I find I see this conversation going on a lot, and there's um, that's actually another great future webinar topic because uh, there's a lot of confusion around this. So there's the ratio of the alcohol to water that is one thing to be uh, considering as you decide how to mix your IPA or your alcohol. Um, I'm a proponent of it. We use it in our academy but we do it safely. So the thing to pay attention to is not only the ratio of the alcohol to water, but also the concentration of the alcohol to begin with in its concentrated form. So alcohol or IPA can be purchased as a concentrate in a wide variety of concentrations. So you have to be very careful what you say about this because 50-50 is not 50-50 based on the concentration. You can actually have a 90% concentration of alcohol in your concentrate, and that 50-50 blend with water is not going to be the same as a concentrate that has, you know, 30% concentration of alcohol, and then you add 50% water. So you really need to kind of be mindful of what you're purchasing in the raw material form and then that ratio. And we in fact use the 50-50 blend here of a 90% concentration of IPA and we blend it 50-50 with water. And I would describe that as, as a little bit on the strong side, but not so strong that we are swelling paint, staining paint, and some of these issues you get when you use IPA, because IPA can be too hot, basically, too, so too strong. Less uh, than, so if we blend 90, 50, 50, you're getting a 45% dilution. So that would be your recommendation, Jason, less than 45% total yeah. IPA. Of net, net 45%, yeah. And one thing to consider is, is if it's too strong, it's gonna evaporate too quickly and you can redeposit whatever material you were trying to remove back on the surface. But yeah, 30 to 45% total dilution, net dilution is probably a good ratio. Safe and then those of you that are in a body shop or a fresh paint environment, you need to be especially careful of what solvents and IPA and things you're spraying on 
very fresh paint. I'm talking about within hours out of the paint booth. Uh, you really got to be careful during that time. And I would suggest that if that's your environment, that you pay attention to the paint manufacturer's recommendation on what you spray on paint in a fresh paint uh, condition. All right, we'll get to two more. I think we've got time for two more here. So uh, somebody asked um, in regards to the, con the fillers in, uh, in products, you know, that maybe they don't expect and silicones. So if a product contains silicone, does that automatically mean it contains fillers? <laughs> All right, uh, a future webinar topic maybe? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of good questions today. Yeah, very good yeah. questions, yeah. So um, here's the reality about this. And again, this is a lot of misconceptions and debates and uh, statements thrown around about fillers and silicone in general. So here's the, I'll try and say this uh, concisely. First of all, the reality is that all products, all compounds, all polishes have the potential to have a filling effect meaning that it can cover up defects instead of removing them. So let me repeat that. All products have the potential and it's technique dependent. Uh, so depending on how you apply that compound and polish, you can have a high filling result or a low filling result, which means more defects removed instead of covered up. So that's one point aside. They all have the potential. Now, aside from that, there is the reality of ingredients. There are intentional fillers. There are ingredients that are intentional filling ingredients. And those are put into products by a lot of companies. Um, there also are ingredients that people think are fillers that are not intentional fillers. Now, silicone is one of those. Silicone is an active ingredient that does several different things in the application process of compounds and polishes. It's not the nasty devil that everybody labels it. Silicone does a lot of fantastic things. And whether you realize it or not, it's helping you every day and you don't even know it. But the, the fact that silicone is an ingredient is that automatically a filler? No. But as I said, it can fill based on your application method. Um, anything else, Todd, do you want to add? No, I think that's, that's good and certainly in your wheelhouse of expertise. I couldn't imagine a more qualified person to answer that question. Oh, thanks. All right, we'll take one last one. We had a lot of questions about paint gauges since we did mention paint thickness and, and everybody's scared now. I think, Jason, you, you freaked everybody out about OEM paint getting too thin. Um, to answer all those of, you, those of you who asked for a specific recommendation, we're not going to recommend any one particular brand. There are a number of quality paint gauges out there that you can find. You just want one that's going to read, um, read the surface accurately. So if you look at reviews or anything, you want to check for accuracy. That's the most important part. Um, but this question specifically is about the go, no go decision. So assuming they're using a paint gauge that reads total film build, um, what's the, what is the recommendation general on when paint is too thin to be polished or when you should be very cautious? Um, what's that limit line in terms of? Okay. So um, yeah, whether you're on a base coat, clear coat system or a single stage, if you are measuring paint thickness, and you come up with a reading on the device that is three mils or less, then I would say that's your go or no go decision. Three mils or less means you are at risk of biting through that paint um, and having an issue. Now for those, um, I got to think globally here in microns, that's in the 76, 70 to 80 90. range. Yeah. Uh, 70, 80 microns. So, um, that thickness, if that's what you're measuring, then you need to call your customer or have a, a talk with yourself about your own car and decide not to be very aggressive on that paint because it's a very risky scenario. So three mils or 70 to 80 microns. The disclaimer on that, of course, is that is not a Rupus recommendation. That is just good advice because you really don't know even if you're using an ultrasonic gauge, which gives you layer thickness, but has a, I think most of them have a plus minus of like 10%, something like that. Um, but that's three mils. That could be 2.5 mils of base and, and 0.5 mils of clear. Now, the reality is 
I've never even come close to seeing that, but that potential does somehow in some weird world exist. So this is just a good recommendation and it's a very solid recommendation. It's the best we can give with limited data, but you really just never know until you do it. Just, you know, be safe and, and, and consider that. All right. Well, on that note, guys, I think we are done. We answered a ton of questions. I'll reiterate for all of those of you who we didn't get to, and I know there was a lot of questions that maybe had some overlap that we missed, but uh, make sure that you send us an email, contact us um, via social media, or just send an email uh, via the website and we can get back to you. Also, make sure you check out the YouTube channel. A lot of good answers to some of these questions on there. Um, Jason, I believe uh, that is it. And Todd, thank you guys very much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Attending. This was our largest webinar to date, uh, 2,000 registrants and upwards of about 400 people on the webinar and countless others watching on Facebook. So we appreciate you guys joining us. We hope it was fun, and uh, we'll see you all on the next one. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thank you.